Welcome back everyone. This is the State of the Nation. Now, one of the critical issues Sri Lanka faces uh, that led to a full-blown crisis was its inability to take control of its energy sector. Basically, to provide adequate supply for the demand due to the Balancing Act and its production being on the borderline, Sri Lanka faced one of the biggest energy crises it has ever experienced since our independence. When we untangle most of what happened in this area, we also see a lot of geopolitical actors at play. In our case, China, India, and of course, the United States. All of those countries are pushing for their needs and wants. Let's get a better understanding. Joining me now from London, UK, via Zoom, is Professor of Political Economy at Cambridge University, Professor Helen Thompson. Uh, she is also the author of the book, Disorder, Hard Times in the 21st Century, a timely book that all of you must read to understand global economics at this moment. Well, good to see you, Professor. Thank you for taking the time to speak to me. First of all, uh, Professor, right now we are at a crucial juncture in the world. Now, the Ukraine war continues. Many things that this might turn out to somewhat of a world war. Many countries in the West are in recession. Despite attempts to whitewash it, the Silicon Valley Bank and several other bank failures in the United States seems to give an indication of a possible collapse of the banking system there. How do you read the current situation around the world to be? Thanks for that, Mahesh. I think we have to separate out the question of what's going on with the Ukraine war and its consequences for the world economy with what's gone on over the last few days with the Silicon Valley Bank. And I think in terms of the disruption that comes from the war, that the fundamental issue for all countries in the world has essentially arisen from the energy implications of the war. And that has meant that European countries, particularly in the first nine months of 2022, had a particularly hard time adjusting to the absence of Russian um, gas in particular, but it's also, as you well know, hit some countries like Sri Lanka extraordinarily hard because essentially European countries have used high prices to take supply away from some Asian countries. I think on the other side, we have what's happened with the Silicon Valley Bank, which this is an older story, I think, in terms of the underlying structural dynamics around it, parallels going back to the 2008 um, crash. But the thing that's different this time and the point where the two things connect together is in order to deal with energy inflation, which the war didn't cause, but definitely fueled, central banks around the world have wanted to raise interest rates and they've been somewhat led in that anyway by the Federal Reserve. But that has come with caused enormous problems for financial corporations that have bet on low interest rates, which is essentially what Silicon Valley Bank uh, did. So we're now in a position where essentially that the United States policymakers at the federal level have had to bail this bank out. And that, that means that it's going to be incredibly difficult for the Fed to carry on with the monetary policy that they uh, have wanted to um, pursue and that will reverberate around the world. Absolutely. Uh, Professor, as you know, Sri Lanka's economy collapsed and is now trying to apply certain measures that uh, have failed Western nations. Now, in your book, you argue the importance of energy independence. Now, in Sri Lanka, the entire crisis began with energy shortages. Now, what are your views on that, especially when a country like Sri Lanka is trying to correct it, uh, its past mistakes? I think that any country that has to import significant amounts of energy, fossil fuel energy from abroad, basically has ongoing problems. Sometimes that those problems are manageable. They're easier to manage in European countries on the whole than they are in poorer Asian um, countries. But the underlying reality of being dependent upon other parts of the world for essentially the energy that makes any economic activity um, possible is, is pretty difficult. I think if you look at what's happened in Sri Lanka, it goes back to what I was saying in my earlier answer, which is that in terms of the European country's ability to move away from Russia, where gas was concerned in particular, they had to put the problem somewhere else because there simply is not sufficient gas supply in the world for European countries to suddenly start buying much more liquid natural gas without other countries with less ability to meet the prices being shut out of that um, market. So the situation for a country like Sri Lanka is that 
kind of need to get away from being in this position of not only fossil fuel foreign dependency, but being in a weak position to compete for supply, particularly with European countries. But it's incredibly difficult to do that because we still live in a world in which fossil fuel energy is the most important, fossil fuel energies are the most important source of, of, of um, energy. So you simultaneously have to have a strategy for dealing with the present, i.e. fossil fuel energy dependency, and a strategy for trying to get to a different place, the energy transition, in which there might be some hope uh, of higher level of uh, energy uh, independence. Though, nonetheless, I think the idea that any country outside probably the United States and Russia that can be completely energy independent, and even then I'm not sure it's true of the United, United States, uh, it's pretty hard to imagine. Absolutely makes a lot of sense. Professor, now, do you expect a possible escalation between China and the US to take form much more significantly? And if so, how could that impact the global economy? After all, these are the two giant economies in the world. I think that what we saw during the course of 2022 was clear deterioration in US-China relations over a number of um, issues. The first being essentially the tech war that the Biden, sorry, the Trump administration uh, had begun and the Biden administration had has continued. And we can see that particularly in the, the semiconductor export ban that Biden put in place against China um, in uh, October. And then we've seen the growing tensions over Taiwan. I think in part they would have come anyway, but they were kind of fueled by Russia's war because it looks like uh, Russia is saying Ukraine belongs to us, China says, Taiwan belongs to us. The United States takes a different view um, on those um, questions. And obviously, the semiconductor issue and the Taiwan issue also go together because 90% of the advanced chips in the world are manufactured in Taiwan. So in any situation in which there was war between China and the United States over Taiwan, we could expect that to have ferocious consequences for the world economy because Chips are as important as to how the world economy works these days as, as uh, energy is. So there's considerable incentive, I think, for US and China to try to reduce the tensions between them because as such, the economic stakes are so high. But at the same time is that they have clear strategic interests um, in the Pacific that clash with each other. And so actually finding compromises around those questions, I think is going, is, is going to be incredibly difficult. I'm not of the view that we're on an inevitable path to a US-China war, but I don't think we should also underestimate the dangerousness of the situation. Indeed, indeed. Uh, well, we have to leave it at that. Uh, many thanks, indeed. Uh, that was Professor Helen Thompson, Professor of Political Economy at Cambridge University in the UK. Let's take a short commercial break. This is the State of the Nation. I will be back with the closing.